So um, <coughs> where we're at, at right now, I think, in uh, world um, political situation is that what we've seen in the ca last couple of de decades is a decline of American power. Uh, the United States has been the sole uh, imperial superpower for some time, and it's tried to uh, strengthen its position by wars in the Middle East, at, uh, uh, um, especially. Uh, and it has been uh, stopped in this effort, especially in Iraq. It has uh, 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 been defeated, uh, uh, has not been, been in a position to maintain their power uh, there. Um, and this has been a, some, something of a turning point that signaled to other imperialist powers that uh, American power is declining and has, be, has started other powers, especially China and Russia, to become more aggressive and to try to uh, broaden their uh, uh, sphere of influence and their room of, uh, for maneuver. Um, I think uh, for uh, Putin, uh, the war in uh, Syria has been very important. Uh, it was the first time that uh, Russia, in a long time, uh, was involved in interventions abroad. Uh, and involved in, you know, uh, maneuvering outside of its uh, direct um, sort of uh, surroundings or um, the direct neighboring countries. Um, and, um, well, I think this, something similar holds for China as well. We've seen uh, a lot of tension in the South China Sea when it comes to uh, military tension and before that a lot of economic uh, uh, activity, you know, the, the new Silk uh, Road project, uh, a lot of investment in uh, Europe during the uh, Eurozone crisis, but also uh, especially in Africa. Uh, so um, I think the decline of uh, American power, uh, the defeat in Iraq, and also uh, I think the broader economic situation is forcing imperialist blocs to, um, uh, uh, to become, or in inter-imperialist tension to be more sharp at the moment, and I think this is going to continue for a whole period. Um, so the Ukraine war, I think we should understand within this context. Right? Russia is trying to win back old uh, positions, and Ukraine is especially important because of it, uh, its access to the Black Sea, it, uh, because of uh, 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 natural uh, resources, but also uh, it, it's been a very important industrial uh, uh, space as well. Um, <coughs> now, this is not the first time, I think. Uh, now, yeah, what, what happened? Be, be, uh, <laughs> what, what I think what we should see here is that the uh, attack on uh, Ukraine is a direct attack on the self the right of self determination of the Ukrainian uh, people. Uh, it's trying to. Uh, occupy this country and to uh, make it part of uh, the Russian uh, Empire again in some way. Um, and, um, but this is, of course, um, uh, in the context of sharper inter-imperialist tensions. Uh, and, of course, we see that uh, uh, rival imperialist blocs are, uh, are very actively intervening in this, uh, in this, uh, in this situation uh, as well. And, so we took the position when the war um, uh, started that uh, when it comes to the in inter-imperialist level, we cannot take sides between uh, the United States or NATO and, uh, uh, and Russia. But when it comes to the war uh, or the attack on the uh, self-determination of the Ukrainian people, we cannot remain, um, how do you call it, um, uh, neutral. We have to uh, stand on the side of the Ukrainian uh, people. Now, this uh, idea or this position is, is uh, uh, quite contested and, uh, internationally, also in, the, in, uh, in this country. Um, and I think um, what uh, a mistake that's often being made is that be the understanding of the um, uh, inter-imperialist level is uh, sort of getting mixed up with the, well, the different levels are being mixed up. Uh, and I think a lot, uh, oftentimes, the whole con uh, conflict is reduced to uh, a conflict between imperialist states, whereas there's no direct military conflict right now between <coughs> uh, military blocs. Um, 
at the best case, this position uh, goes something like this, that uh, theoretically the Ukrainian people have a right to def defend themselves, but they should not um, uh, arm themselves with uh, Western weapons because that would allow uh, Western imperialism to you know, use uh, this war uh, to its advantage. Um, this, I think, is a problematic position because if you say that uh, U Ukrainian people have a right to defend themselves, it means that they also have a right to choose how they defend themselves, how they arm themselves, when they uh, make peace or, or, uh, or whether they uh, make peace. Um, at worst, I think uh, there's this idea of um, revolutionary defeatism being evoked in this discussion as saying, uh, like uh, what Liebknecht said, right, the main enemy is at home, is taken to mean um, that the main enemy is not uh, in The Hague or in Washington, but is actually in Kiev. And that uh, uh, because uh, like Ukra Ukraine is looking to the West for support, uh, there, therefore we must uh, uh, wish or work towards the defeat of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Ukraine. Well, I think both these positions, or uh, both variants, I, uh, I should say, are uh, uh, completely at odds with uh, internationalist pr principles because uh, I, it's always been, um, you know, a very important principle to support any uh, uh, resistance to uh, uh, to imperialist uh, occupation or imperialist wars of conquest, as as this uh, this one is. Um, I think. Um, well, this is something particular in our uh, tradition, which is, has, has been very, um, uh, we've al always been very vocal about, that when it comes to uh, people resisting imperialist um, uh, occupation, whether it's occupation or whether it's a war of conquest, that uh, we all always support the oppressed unconditionally but critically. And these uh, difference or these positions are, are very important because we don't uh, we underline the fundamental right of the oppressed to fight back against uh, imperialism. Whereas we might be critical of how they do it, we might be critical of their leaders. This does not um, detract from the principal um, sort of um, uh, questions. And this was, for example, very important in. Um, in Iraq, when we uh, during the Iraq War, when we had all these discussions, but should we all not also be against Assad, or are the uh, insurgents who are fighting against uh, the Americans are they really that much better? Uh, we always say we have to be principled in these uh, questions. The Iraqis have the right to defend themselves. The, the Americans have no right to take over this uh, country. We support the. Uh, resistance uh, unconditionally, though uh, critically. Um, now, I think the idea that you can somehow reduce Ukraine to the Western capitalist bloc is wrong on several levels. I think theoretically, it's been a very important discussion uh, about 100 years ago uh, with the debate between uh, Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, uh, where Rosa Luxemburg said um, any uh, uh, struggle for national liberation is always going to, you know, take place in an uh, imperialist world, and it's going to uh, allow other uh, blocks to intervene, which is of course true. Lenin uh, was very firm and said, "But this does not mean that every war is an imperialist war. This that does not mean uh, that every, uh, you know, country being supported by uh, imperialism in, in some way can also always be, you know." reduced to, to such. And I think the, qu the fundamental question here is whether these struggles take place within the context of a direct uh, military confrontation between um, uh, imperialist blocs. This was, for example, the case in the First World War, where there was a, a lot of national conflicts involved as well, but it was fundamentally a fun an, in, an uh, imperialist war. Uh, or whether it's basically one imperialist power taking over a non-imperialist uh, 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 power. Uh, this is a very different uh, situation, I, I think. Um, on secondly, more analytically, I think uh, the idea that Ukraine is somehow um, 
maybe a, a, a vassal state of the West is fundamentally wrong. And I think uh, you can um, uh, see this in the leaks that have been published in, I think, Washington Journal or Wall Street Journal. I always get them mixed up. But the Pentagon uh, leaks, uh, they show that it's actually Zelensky who wants uh, to draw in the West, uh, uh, but the, the United States who are mo mostly on the break. They, they, uh, um, and I think this is understandable um, because uh, from both pers per perspectives, um, Ukraine uh, is a smaller country. They want to, they are looking around with, uh, uh, for the biggest bully on the playing field and they try to bring them in to support them. Uh, on the other hand, the Americans, they don't want uh, a direct uh, confrontation with, with Ru Russia. They want to draw out the conflict. They want to weaken Russia over a longer peri period of time. And they want to make sure that it's not their soldiers dying in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, but they are happy to allow uh, Ukrainians to, uh, uh, to die for. How much time do I have? Uh, four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, I'll skip the next part then. Um, so I think one of the reasons, um, one of the d discussions on, on the background is that many people are uh, wondering, okay, what, 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 but what can we do? I think that's an, an um, uh, sentiment that we hear a lot of in in the Netherlands that there's a lot of people who are looking at the slaughter in Ukraine and are thinking, but we need to be able to do something. And from this idea are supporting calls that the Dutch government or the EU should intervene and force the, um, the Ukrainians into negotiations or, or, uh, or something. I don't think this is an, uh, an, an, an answer. I think it's understandable at, at some uh, 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 level. Um, but um, I think uh, we should be very clear on what you know level um, we intervene in this uh, uh, conflict, um, and this this means um, being uh, opposed to um, uh, further intervention from Western imperialist power, being involved, uh, being opposed to uh, well, what we're seeing right now is right, especially in the beginning of the war, uh, there was this huge propaganda saying. This is why we need the army. This is why we need NATO, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think we should combat uh, this, and we should uh, 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 combat the idea that we need more arms spending or whatever, that NATO is somehow this peace-spreading uh, uh, um, entity or something. I should think we should resist the, the Russophobia, right, the, the racist uh, uh, framing of this uh, uh, um, uh, conflict. I think we should um, definitely fight for refugees' rights uh, and for equal refugee uh, 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 rights. But I think we should avoid anything that delegitimizes the uh, struggle of that Ukrainians are, are, are fighting, uh, and also uh, of, uh, especially of undermining uh, that struggle. And I think many of the calls for peace negotiations, they uh, start from the idea that uh, Ukrainian resistance to Russian imperialism is somehow the biggest obstacle uh, for peace, and I would say that it's m mostly pacifists who take this position. I would would say they um, sort of um, don't distinguish between peace and death. Right? It doesn't make a sound either. Doesn't make a sound, but it's not the same uh, thing. So the reason why I think this this um, uh, debate is important be is because we're only at the start of this historical period. And, um, I think it's um, um, very um, understandable that many people are keen to um, not let it escalate, but we're going to see man many more conflicts on the fault lines of uh, imperialist uh, blocks. We're going to see, I mean, Taiwan is on the agenda. There's, there's more of these um, conflicts coming up. And I think. The fear of escalation can be um, uh, can tempt um, uh, some anti-war uh, activists to sort of res start respecting territorial cr claims of imperialist uh, countries. That we say, like, okay, maybe Taiwan uh, 
it, uh, they they have a, uh, the the people of Taiwan have a, have a different opinion, but let's not support their struggle against uh, China when it breaks out, because uh, you know what what uh, what could come of it. And uh, I think it's um, uh, well. This is one of the reasons why I think it's very much important to uh, while. Um, fighting back, especially against our own imperialist uh, uh, governments, that we um, uh, understand that there's sometimes other imperialist blocs taking over uh, 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 sovereign peoples and, uh, and people fighting uh, uh, them. And I think, uh, uh, well, we uh, uh, should support them and also um, um, uh, I think the, the, one of the important points is that um, imperialist blocs see these, uh, these peoples as loose change, right? They see them as, uh, as uh, bargaining chips or, or something. I think um, the internationalists and socialists would run the risk of doing the exact same thing if we were to say, like, uh, okay, uh, if, if, if there's different imperialist powers involved, let's, let's just keep our hands off this uh, conflict. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Can people hear me all right? Yeah, good. Well, look, first of all, thanks to the IS in Netherlands for allowing me to come here and debate this, this important question. Uh, and thank you for letting me debate it in English because my Dutch is terrible. So um, I very much appreciate the, the chance to have this discussion. First of all, let me say what we agree on. There is no disagreement about the suffering of the Ukrainian people. Uh, the barbarity of what Putin's army is doing in Ukraine, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, both civilians, Ukrainian soldiers, and also Russian conscript soldiers who are also in many ways victims of this, this conflict. The argument is not over abstract principles though. There's two extremely concrete questions. The first concrete question is, should we see this conflict primarily through the lens of self-determination? Or should we see it as an element in a broader, anti a broader clash between imperialisms? And I'm going to argue we should see it as the latter. Secondly, what do socialists, revolutionary socialists who are against imperialism, say if they happen to live in NATO countries, like Netherlands or Britain? What is our demand of our state, our government in that context? If I was in Russia, very unlikely, but if I were in Russia, I would be giving a very, very different uh, position, but we're in a NATO country, and we have to understand what our responsibility is in that specific context with regard to the intervention of our government, our state, into this conflict. Now, I think it's very important to say that the right to self-determination, uh, the concept of national liberation and so on, is not some abstract universal principle that we just apply without examining the concrete context. Let me give you some concrete examples. Um, because there's a claim that the IST tradition always defends national liberation struggles. If you go back to the late 1990s and the clashes that were taking place in the former Yugoslavia, there was genuine oppression of, Al of Albanian people in the province of, of, of Kosovo by the Serbian military and state which threatened to, to, dis to dis um, destroy the rights of self-determination for those Albanian people. We did not for one second support NATO arming the Kosovo Liberation Army. We did not support the NATO intervention against Serbia. And we didn't subordinate our anti-imperialism to the concept of self-determination in that context. Let me give you a second example, uh, an even older example. The Austro-Hungarian invasion of Serbia in 1914. Um, Serbia had long been a victim of Austrian aggression. It was, its very existence as an independent state was threatened by the Austrian invasion. This was clearly a defensive war by the Serbian people. What did the revolutionary socialist current in Serbia say? Let me quote uh, from Dusan Popovic, one of the key revolutionary socialists within Serbia. He says, the war between Serbia and Austria was only a small part of the totality, merely the prologue to a universal European war. And this could not, have, have, could not fail to have a clearly pronounced imperialist character. His party didn't vote 
for war credits. They voted against war credits to arm the Serbian forces against Austrian aggression. Why did they do that? Because they saw the broader context, context of anti-imperialist struggle. And that was the starting point in that concrete situation. By the way, Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky all agreed with that position taken by the Serbian revolutionists in that context. It is not an absolute abstract principle. We look concretely at the dynamic of inter-imperialist conflict and we determine our position in, in the context of deciding what position will most weaken and under, undermine imperialism as a system and what will most effectively break workers in our country from support from their own national government if we're in an aggressor or powerful imperialist country like Netherlands or Britain. And therefore, we have to distinguish between two different situations. We have to distinguish between situations dominated by, inter by, by nationalist struggles against imperialism that can genuinely weaken imperialism. Good example, the conflict in Afghanistan or the conflict in Iraq, where we're absolutely clear we want to see NATO, America, Britain, and so on defeated in those conflicts by the resistance. Ugly though the resistance was in many times in Afghanistan and Iraq, we wanted them to defeat uh, our own imperialists, or equally in the Vietnam War, and the Vietnamese resistance was armed to some extent by the Soviet Union, but the Vietnamese resistance managed to maintain its political independence. The dominant character of the Vietnam War was a character of a national liberation struggle against American imperialism by uh, an anti-imperialist fort that had already fought off French imperialism, that already had its independent politics well established. That is not the, the case in Ukraine. I'm not saying that national defense and national self-determination doesn't feature in the conflict. It's clearly very important to the people who are fighting on the ground. But the dominant character of the conflict in Ukraine is the proxy war between NATO uh, and Russian imperialism. Why do I say that? And it means we can't be silent, by the way, on NATO's role. So why do I say it's a proxy war? Uh, well, the other speaker has put it very well. Uh, what does NATO want in this? A long, drawn-out conflict in which Ukrainian people die. I agree with that. that. That is practically the definition of a proxy war. NATO wants Ukrainian people to die for NATO aims in this conflict. That's a proxy conflict. Now... We have to understand the role historically that NATO has played in gendering these conflicts in the region. This is not to say that Russian imperialism is not a factor. Of course, Russian imperialism is a factor. Um, Russia is trying to, to establish its authority in, it, in what it's called its, its near abroad, in neighboring states in the region. It wants to play a regional role akin to the role that America plays on a global level. We understand that. Uh, Russian imperialism we condemn absolutely. But we have to understand in this region that NATO and the European Union as well have played a major role. Since the end of the Cold War, the borders of NATO have expanded 800 miles eastwards and 13 different countries have been integrated into NATO. This is a strengthening of US and NATO imperialism in the region. It's in this context that you have a series of clashes between Russian and Western imperialism, which often take the form of proxy struggles uh, taking place. You see the way that Russia has also manipulated nationalist sentiment in Moldova, uh, in Georgia, and so on, uh, to fulfill its goals in the region as well. So this is the character of the conflict. It's shaped by imperialism. R Ukraine is part of this process. Ukraine's ruling class at various points balanced between East and West, trying to play them off against each other. Uh, from 2014, for complex reasons, but you, know, you can read about it in International Socialism, we've written extensively uh, about this, the Ukrainian ruling class tilted decisively towards the West. In response to that, Russian imperialism intervenes, first seizing the Crimea and so on, and now... Uh, under Zelensky, launching a full-scale invasion. That context is very important to understand the nature of the conflict. 
It is also to understand, important to understand the extent to which you, what Ukraine is doing is now dependent on and shaped by NATO. Let me give you some examples. Total Western economic aid to Ukraine, military and non-military aid, has now reached 151 billion euros. How much is 151 billion euros? It's four times the total annual state budget of Ukraine. In other words, NATO is bankrolling Ukrainian state spending four times over. It is completely dependent on this financial uh, support. Uh, Ukraine's military budget was 5.5 billion euros before the war. <coughs> military aid alone from NATO's country, NATO countries is 10 times as high. It is completely dependent on military spending from NATO countries. Uh, the US is spending as much on military aid to Ukraine as it spent each year on the conflict in Afghanistan. This is the extent of American support for the conflict in the region. This begins to look like a proxy conflict. The tanks that are being used today in the counteroffensive against Russia are German, British, and American tanks and weaponry. This, this is the extent of support that's going on. And it's not just uh, arms with, with, with no strings attached. This is part of a process explicitly of integrating the Ukrainian military into NATO command structures. This is a long-term goal of NATO and a long-term goal of Ukraine. These weapon systems are designed to uh, network into the NATO command structure across, uh, across the region. Uh, not only that, but even before the conflict, 26,000 Ukrainian officers were directly trained by NATO. NATO has uh, advisors on the ground, it has trainers on the ground, it's providing the targeting information to direct the missile systems that Ukraine is using. This is not Vietnam in the 1960s, it's a very different character to the conflict. That's not to diminish why Ukrainians believe they're fighting, they may well see it as a battle for national defense, but we have to understand the wider uh, context and what NATO is doing in this conflict. Thirdly, Ukraine's war aims are subordinated to those of NATO. Uh, a condition for the supply of weaponry by the US is that this weaponry is not used on Russian soil. It fits very well with wh what's already been said. The goal of NATO is to bleed Russia. The goal of NATO is to weaken Russia without engaging in a full-scale military confrontation with Russia. Why does NATO want to weaken Russia? First, to strengthen, and sorry, this is explicit. There are loads of quotes I can give you that this is what NATO are trying to do in the region. Um, let me give you one of them, actually, by the US Secretary of, of State from December. He says, uh, the goal in Ukraine is to push back against Russian uh, aggression and to retake territory seized from it since February the 24th. In other words, the goal for NATO is not to reconquer the whole of Ukraine, it's to push Russia back. It's to engage in a prolonged conflict to bleed Russia. Why is it trying to do that? First of all, to further NATO goals across Eastern Europe and across the Eurasian Peninsula. Secondly, to prepare for a wider conflict with China. This is about reviving NATO. Why is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, trying to build a headquarters in Japan at the moment? To encircle China. This is part of a process of reviving, restoring, and rebuilding the NATO alliance for a future conflict with China. And it is disastrous for socialists in this context to say, we will defend Taiwanese self-determination. Sorry, do we really want to see a clash between Chinese imperialism and a proxy uh, Taiwanese force supported by NATO in the uh, seas off China? This is an absolutely catastrophic prospect. We have to be saying that our interests lie in the weakening of NATO, not the revival of NATO through its engagement in this conflict. And none of this has anything to do with supporting the Ukrainian people. Uh, Boris Johnson our former Prime Minister in Britain has been absolutely clear when he talks about his visits to Zelensky. One of the key arguments he put, he's completely open about this, he advised Zelensky, do not try to engage in peace talks. 
We want to see the war. This is very explicit in Britain and America's uh, goals in the region. In terms of strengthening NATO, look at what's happening across, across the region now. Uh, Ukraine is likely to join NATO if, if this conflict ends. Uh, Georgia uh, expects to be integrated into NATO. Not just that, but Sweden and Finland. Finland has now joined NATO. Sweden is likely to join NATO. This is a strengthening of imperialism in the region. It's something we should absolutely oppose. And in terms of how Zelensky views the conflict, I think it's worth quoting uh, Zelensky when he makes his offer in return to imperialism, where he says that after the war, um, Ukraine will not be a liberal state, Ukraine will be a big Israel. In other words, it will be an outpost of uh, NATO imperialism in the region. And the Amer senior American figures respond to this. Dan Shapiro, a former um, Obama ambassador to Israel and Biden's special liaison to Israel, agrees and he's mapped out a series of proposals for how Ukraine could fulfill that role of operating like an Israel in Eastern Europe, defending imperialist interests in the region. And finally, on, on the, the character of the conflict, we have to understand this is part of a sharpening of inter-imperialist tensions generally, which has led to a growth in military uh, spending on a global scale in which military spending has now reached a record $2 trillion. It has brought the world closer to a nuclear exchange than at any point since the end of the Cold War, and that's a catastrophe. Okay, I'll, I'll sum up on this. So that's the character of the conflict, and it's why I see it as predominantly a proxy conflict rather than a conflict that can be analyzed solely or primarily through the lens of self-determination. What does it mean for us? The problem is that much of what I will call the pro-NATO left, and I'm not accusing my, my fellow speaker of being pro-NATO here, but you do get people in Britain in particular, many other countries, who essentially put forward arguments indistinguishable from what the leading figures in our ruling class argue. How do we distinguish ourselves from the Dutch government or the British government? We can't do it if what we're saying is we need Ukraine to be armed. We have to talk concretely to the military supplies being uh, directed by NATO powers to Ukraine to further their own aims in the region. Our position has to be to condemn Russian imperialism but to also direct our fire against our own government and its goals in the region. The main enemy as at home is, is not an abstract slogan in this context, it's concrete. We have to distinguish ourselves, particularly those of us in NATO countries, from our own ruling class. And that means that we have to say, as difficult as it is, we oppose what NATO is doing, we oppose the arms, arms shipments to Ukraine, we oppose the financial aid to the Ukrainian government, and we see the future of this conflict, uh, the most progressive outcome, as being de-escalation and a call for rebellion, whether in Russia, in Ukraine, or in the West, to stop this war, to de-escalate the conflict. That's a difficult argument. It's not difficult everywhere, by the way. I should say, outside of Netherlands, Poland, Britain, and North America, it's an easy argument, because most countries in the world, that's the mainstream position. It's only in the countries where the NATO propaganda is most dominant that this is a massive argument on the left. Uh, people should be aware of that. That's not like that in the rest of the world. But I understand that in Netherlands and in Britain, you'll start as a minority on this argument. It's not new. Leon Trotsky joked in 1915 that the first Zimmerweld conference, the entire inter in internationalist left, fitted into three carriages on the way from the station to the conference hall. We start as a minority, but as the conflict deepens and develops, as the social costs of that conflict become more apparent, as the cat catastrophe of interim post escalation worsens, we can grow from being a small minority to carrying an argument with the mass of people. And that has to be our, our position. For an internationalist, anti-imperialist uh, position that says no to the Russian invasion, but also no to NATO.